Welcome back, everybody. Isn't the refreshed refreshment bar super nice? Really good, right? Oh, by the way, uh, for the vegetarians, uh, the potato dish, it does have little bits of bacon. Um, I, I thought there are red peppers, but the tiny little two millimeter by two millimeter squares are bacon. Plus that dish tastes way too good not to have animal fat in it. So that's, it's very good, okay. Um, so we're having a wonderful morning. This really reminds me of just the good old days in medicine where people got together in person and they learn things that help them be better physicians, and you know they, they got to know one another better, um, and I, it's, it's just wonderful, just, just loving it here today. Okay, we have a fabulous next speaker. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Morrison has a PhD, in, oh, and she waved to you. She has a P, <laughs> just in case you didn't know, that's her standing right there. She has a PhD in social psychology. She's also a, a licensed clinical social worker, plus she has a master's in um, addiction counseling. Plus, uh, she is the CEO and principal of, of E. Morrison Consulting. Are, are you the E? I mean, is it, you, she's the E. So let's please, and, and also, uh, she's been a great friend of the Medical Society, uh, uh, helping us with you know, multiple initiatives and projects and lending her expertise. So let's give it up for Dr. Morrison. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. That was great. When he said he was going to introduce me, I was like, oh, no, they're so painful to listen to introductions, <laughs> you know, about yourself. But that was like, thank you so much. Um, I am kind of a friend of the Medical Society. I am super happy to be here. I was here last year. Um, and so, yeah, I feel really grateful. I don't see Aileen right now, but I wanted to thank her. I met Lindsay, who I've worked with for years, and met her for the first time today. Um, I should have warned you how tall I am. Like, hello. <laughs> when you only meet people on Zoom, like, you don't know that they're going to be, like, you know, oddly tall like myself. Um, but, yeah. I'm, and it's really, it's really exciting to me that we have medical students here. Um, so I just met Joe, who said he lives five minutes away. Um, so <laughs> he's a medical student. It's great. He just got coffee and walked over. So, um, well, Lindsay asked me if I, well, let me go back to two more thank yous to Andrew. That was fantastic, the de-escalation um, session that he just did. And also Sam. Thank you so much, Sam, because you're like the cat corraller for like people, like the presenters, and um, I just really appreciate your support in getting ready for this. Um, Lindsay asked me, hey, do you want to come back? And I said, totally, I want to come back. I pitched her some positive psychology ideas. I pitched her some happiness practices, and she said, no, I really think we need to talk about this. I'm like, oh, great, thanks. Give me an hour to fix that for everybody. Great. Um, give me an easy topic, why don't you? Um, and um, the reason, of course, is that this is, um, it's, it's kind of not really solvable. It's kind of not really solvable. And it's a really, really common experience. I was just chatting with some of you at break who were saying this is my experience too. Um, so really what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about it in the context of what we know about trauma. So if Andrew was sort of talking about, you know, how we can sort of work with people who are angry with us, who feel, who are demanding of us, who are um, distrustful of us, I'm really talking about what do we do with the impact on us, on how that feels for us. So the first thing that I wanted to say is, because I've been preparing for this for many months, um, especially over the last week, I've been thinking about you all and just really thinking about medical providers and medical providers in my life. Um, I work with medical providers a lot now because I worked in FQHC for many years as a chief behavioral health officer. And then now in my company, we do work primarily with Medicaid health plans and hospitals and primary care centers. And um, so I feel like, you know, physicians and PAs and MPs are like a huge part of my work life. And I want to go back. This is Alaska. This is Anchorage. This is where I'm from. And um, I was really thinking deeply about the impact that a medical providers have had on my life. And I want to just ask you all to think about that for a minute with me. Um, cause we're gonna, so we can sort of break the ice with some of the people next to you cause we're gonna do a little talking to each other during this session. 
So in case you think this is super beautiful, because it is, because Alaska is known for being beautiful and Anchorage is a beautiful city on the water, it actually looks more like this the great majority of the year. Um, so that was my life. I was born there. I lived there till I was 35. This is why I left, not this. This is not why anybody leaves. This is why I left. And there's only, this is the out, straight out of the almanac, only 60 days a year with sun. So it's brutal up there. Um, but what I was thinking about is when I was 13 years old, um, my parents who didn't have health insurance and we only went to the doctor once a year, took me to see a pediatrician for a physical so I could play basketball. And um, I still remember her name. Her name was Dr. Burke and I'd never met her before. My mom had never met her before. It's not like I'd seen her. And when we were in the room with her, at the end, my mom said to her, I'm not sure how to say this or bring this up, but I'm really worried about her. Um, my husband has alcoholism, and I'm really worried about my kids. And um, I was totally shocked that my mom said it. it. You know, I had no idea that she was going to do that. I asked her about it later, and she said she thought it was like, a, she was so desperate and worried about me that it, she thought it was like this one chance to get help. Like, who else to get help from except for a doctor that you're seeing? And um, that doctor talked to us for maybe five minutes. And so I'm here to tell you the five-minute increments that you spend with patients can be deeply healing and deeply helpful. Because she didn't have a computer back then, of course. It's 40 years ago or something. But I remember her looking at me. I remember her looking at my mom. I remember her saying, thank you for telling me that. I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, what do you think about talking to a counselor? And she referred us to a counselor, and my mom took me to see that counselor, and to, I, that tracked my entire life because I became a therapist as a result of the, ther of the therapist that I saw. And so I, I wanted to tell you that piece, and I'll tell you one more thing, which is I went to Penn State. Um, this is the student health building. This is where the... Um, medical care is and because I was there and I had insurance for the first time I decided I was gonna go get a physical and there was a nurse practitioner there and her name was Natalie and I saw her very often during the years that I was at Penn State and she was one of the most non-judgmental best listeners that I have ever had she was better than some of the therapists that I've seen um, and I really feel like these two experiences that I had with these providers have made such big sort of trajectories in my life that I wanted to ask you all just to think to yourself when you were a patient, when you were a patient, when you were receiving care about a medical provider who had a really, really big positive impact on you. So for those of you who are on um, Zoom, hi. Um, hi, everybody wave. Hi. Hi, Zoom people. I know, I know there's a lot of you, and I'm sorry because we can't do breakouts, um, but you can absolutely chat in about this. For those of you here, I want you to find the person who's closest to you. So for you guys, you'll probably turn around. Um, there you go. And for you too, you probably will be with John. Um, if there's three of you, that's okay. If you guys can scoot in a little bit and that sucks. So look at the person closest to you. If you need to have three people, that's okay. Just make sure nobody's alone. Nobody's alone. And share with each other. Share with each other about that medical provider that had a positive impact on your life. I'm going to give you two minutes, so you got to be quick. Finish up and come on back. Come on back. Come on back. Carolyn, you're supposed to help be helping me with Russell. Oh. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Um, let me ask you all something. If you think about when you were listening, when you were the person who was listening, to your partner or to the third, a per, the third person in your group. What did you hear about your partner's values? If you really think about like what they share with you, what does it say about their values? Yeah. Work 
working out. Oh, <laughs> my, my two partners are dedicated and um, obviously very good at what they do, but also creative when it comes to problem solving and um, took steps to make things better for themselves. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, thanks for jumping in there. I was afraid maybe the word values was like a little bit of a conversation stopper. Um, so maybe strengths is another way of saying it. You're talking about creativity, you're talking about dedication, and you're talking about a willingness to try new things to solve. Yeah, what else? What did you hear about your partner's strengths? So I heard that my partners really value the quality of the care that they provide mm -hmm. and the patient relationships that they develop. Yeah, that that's really important to your, to your partner. The quality of care and the relationships, the relational aspect. Yeah. John? Hold on. Here she comes. Here she comes. Feels like the price is right a little bit. <laughs> Uh, both of my chatting partners uh, really value education. Oh. Dr. Collins has been teaching medical students and PA students and NP students from UC Davis for a long time. Uh -huh. And uh, he really enjoys it. And they give him the feedback that, you know, they learned a lot from him. And, and uh, he feels like he learns from them, too. And, uh, and then Dr. Shu, he, um, he started, he helped to start California North State. He really believes in education. Like what? creating a whole new place for a new, landing, a new landing place for students. So. Yeah, w without him, I wouldn't have a second career, so thanks. Yeah. John, can I ask you something? Because one of the reasons that I ask this question is often when people say what helped them, it's usually something that has to do with their values and their strengths. So was that part of the conversation about what helped these guys? That's exactly what we talked about. <gasps> Just making sure you stayed on topic, John. Just kidding. <laughs> We, just, it, we, we talked I'm about so, values congruent living uh, because um, I, th I think that's the deal. If, if you live on yeah. your values, you have a great life. Yeah, and when we think about trauma and hardships in our own lives and in our patients' lives, in this case, the hard things that we have all been through in the last couple years, particularly in relationships with patients or in our organizations, one of the things that often gives hardship meaning is being reminded of our strengths and our values. And so providing high quality care and being connected to our patients when we know that's a core value and education is a core value, then the hardships start to, um, we hold them a little bit softer. It's like, I know what my values are, regardless of what is happening and the difficulties. Like, I know, I know what's important to me and I'm acting on that and I'm acting on that. What about others? What'd you hear from your partners? She's coming, she's coming. Um, what I heard from my um, talking partner is something that's really struck me as uh, the validation to what we all do here and in Placer County, which I represent, is what she said that the most difficult time in the last two years, she just uh, looked for her partners, her physicians around her, her colleagues who are in the same boat, who understand what she's going through, who validate her feelings. Nice. And it's a society that brings people together. That's exactly her words. It's a society. It's yeah. what we do. It's what brings us all together. And we help each other in the good times and bad. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. I mean, because it is about also about the uh, medical society and also all of you here. And it sounds like connecting, right? Connecting to others, being in relationship with people who are, have the same values and the same um, experiences is super important. So one of the things I want to say as I'm ending here is that this works with our patients too. When our patients share very difficult things with them, when we can give them a couple minutes of deep listening, even if it's one or two minutes, every single practice that we did here was under three minutes, just so you know. Um, when we can listen for their strengths and their values, and when we can feed back to them what we see, that the reason they're so upset about their son being incarcerated is because they love their son so much and family is so important to them. Right? When we hear our colleagues talk to us about how difficult it is right now in the system that we're working in, or when this percentage of our patients thinks we're, you know, sort of evil or something, um, to say to them, I know why this bothers you. 
Like you're deeply dedicated to your patients and to being helpful. Otherwise it wouldn't trouble you. So when we listen for strengths and are able to feed that back um, to the people that we're talking with, it does something to the hardship. It sands off the edges of hardship. Okay. Um, hmm. Sorry. Oh. Uh, hold on one second. I think I got it. Did that do it? Oh. Um. Okay, right? So, this is a pygmy armadillo. I'm so glad you had that reaction. Because I put this slide in, I took it out. I put it in, I took it out. I, put, I was like, God, it's so weird. But um, <laughs> let me tell you what the reason that I left it in. Oh, sorry. Let me tell you the reason that I left this in. And I hope, I hope the people that are on the Zoom are also like, oh. This, um, so this is an animal rescue just north of Los Angeles. And my daughter's a big animal lover. And for her birthday, I got her like this, like a little bit behind the scenes thing. And we got to feed this little pygmy armadillo. Um, but the reason that I have this at the end here is because awe, A-W-E, awe, is, is a feeling that has been studied now for maybe the past six years. So it's a very, very new area of study. And there's a really interesting body of research on awe and what it does to us when we have moments of awe, the impact on us. And you, will not, you probably don't need research to tell you that one of the impacts of awe is that we get perspective on our lives and the things that are troubling us, like the sort of day-to-day -day troubles, and that we feel kind of inspired and amazed at like the world that we live in. And I frequently, all of us are different in where we feel awe, right? Some of us, it's like outside in trees, for some of it's ocean, for some of us, it's stars, for some of us, it's new babies. You know, um, for some of us, it's like when we hear that like sort of moral bravery, when people do like incredibly brave things in the face of, you know, just, terrible sort of barriers. And I really get it around animals. Just like how complicated they are. Look at this thing. It doesn't even look like it should be on this planet. Like it's just so strange, you know, it's so tiny. And so I really get it. And so just in ending, especially since we're talking about sort of deep difficulties, I wanted to ask some of you to think about when is the last time you felt awe? When is the last time you felt awe? And, and one, of the th one of the things in the research about awe that we know is that we can't control awe or make it happen. We can, though, put ourselves in positions where we're more apt to be able to experience it. So if we know it happens for us when we look at the moon, then we can look at the moon more often, right? If we know it happens for us when we're with babies, we can make that happen more often. Um, so I kind of know that this is where I get a lot of awe, and so I spend a lot of time at animal rescues and sanctuaries. Um, so before we end, I just want to ask if some people would be willing to share what brings them awe. Yeah. Wait, wait, sorry. That was my fault because I said go ahead, yeah. Um, I feel awe when I look at my children's faces. Yeah, our kids, our kids' faces. Others? I actually feel it with the patient interaction when I've been with them for a really long time and I'm a pediatrician when they're graduating, graduating on and just like, ah. ah. The last 18 years have been just so awesome and having that connection for so long and then the bigger awe is when they bring their kids back to see me, right? So right. Um, it's just, it, that's, that's an awe. Like, oh man, and you had a, yeah. in, I made an impact, you know? So it's, it, that, that's a big awe moment for me. It's interesting because you're talking about both A-W-E and A-H, like ah, you know? Like there's, and it's perspective giving. It's like the 18 years, right? Like the lifetime, we get the perspective, yeah. Actually, I had an awe moment. Um, Facebook actually does this like, I saw a post that I did like 10 years ago, like when I was in medical school yeah. of like saying like uh, when I was like a, um, like a rotation that I did. 
and just be thinking back of how what how I was back then and where I am now. Those moments that give you awe. Yes, and, you had one. Yeah, like that. Like where you were and where you, and are, where now. you are now. Again, that's like that perspective giving. Like right. Like look at yeah. Anybody else that's here? Yeah. You mentioned like the moon and looking at flowers. Yeah. I, I just realized that I get so much awe when I hear other people talk very passionately about anything. Oh. So like this talk is like amazing. It's like, oh. but like I think about like when I go to like a science museum or like when if I go to like the art museum and someone's like just like really into a painting, I'm like, oh yes, so I'm like there with you. And that's so exciting. <sighs> That is so interesting. Like you get off from other people's like passion and engagement and seeing that. Yeah, that's so amazing. I love that. Yeah. I actually asked my patients this question just so you know. It's, it's a way to know them in a different way when we hear their answers to this. And it usually, you know, we always say when I train therapists, I always say, if you ask someone a question and they say, huh, and they like look down or they say, huh, and they look up, like that moment where they're scanning and thinking and self-reflecting, like that's like this magic moment, you know? Okay, we're gonna have to end. Um, I have a website where everything on it is free because I, I always have that like, oh, and Sam, I forgot my disclosure slide. I've got nothing to disclose. Um, so sorry, I just realized. Um, but I have a, a, quite a bit about de-escalation on my website and there's a lot about trauma-informed care. And some of the things that we talked about here today that we can are doing for each other, can do for ourselves, can do for our patients, when people have been through very difficult things, um, there's a lot sort of in-depth stuff about that on my website, so I wanted to get that. And I'd love to hear from anybody, if anybody wants to email me, because I'd love to chat with people. We actually have a question oh, sorry. online. Yeah, yes. lay it on me. So we, we have lots of interaction going on online, by the way. So you thank guys, you. I'm they sorry. were participating. The eyeline people. They, they did a great job participating. So awesome. um, Evelyn is asking, how do you address the patient that does not want to accept, believe, or agree with the medical advice or recommendation despite using the techniques that you have discussed here? Yeah, man, what do you do? Anyone? Yeah. I mean, I think that for, for, for me, and I think like part of the reason we're laughing is what do you do? There's, there's, there's nothing you can do except strengthen the relationship, right? Is to say, thank you so much for being honest with me. I really appreciate you sharing everything that you've, you know, told me. It sounds like we're on different sides of this thing. And um, there you go. Uh, because in motivational interviewing, when somebody doesn't want to change or is on a completely different side or doesn't see that they have an addiction or doesn't want to get the vaccine or what we know doesn't work is pushing, convincing, persuading, cajoling, proving, disproving. We know it actually um, weakens the relationship and we're never going to be able to help them if we don't have the relationship. So our online folks there really is nothing to do but double down on the relationship and let the other stuff go. I hope that wasn't a downer to end on. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Morrison, that was clearly awesome. Uh, and Dr. Smith, thank you for your wonderful talk this morning also. I can't think of the last com medical conference I've gone to where I did not fall asleep two lectures in a row. <laughs> so they must have been very, very good. Okay.